to get to hockey tonight. That's a good thing. The Dan York State of Mind program is brought to you in part by Lookout Rhode Island and Taco Comfort Solutions. You know, things come in, I don't know if they come in bunches, at least uh, pairs. I, I, I bumped into Joe McDonald, he used to run, uh, used to write for the Providence Journal uh, in sports, and now he covers the Bruins for the Atlantic, which is this really growing uh, the sports publication. Uh, and I got a chance to talk a little hockey with him, so that was a little bit of a fix, because in the middle of the summer, you don't talk a lot about hockey. Uh, and tonight, we've got Vin Simenian, the chair of the Rhode Island Hockey Hall of Fame, uh, a big splash last year with their initial offering and here in September they're doing it again and tickets are available and the lineup is bigger and better than ever and we'll give you the background on it and uh, the lineup for the inductees coming up momentarily so stick around for that. Glad to have you aboard on this Thursday evening. Uh, been a hard week. Uh, our last couple of nights we've had uh, some uh, repeat shows due to some time off so to speak. Uh, earlier this week, we had the chair of IGT, Bob Vincent. If you didn't see that show, you should check into it because it's a really, really expensive controversy here in Rhode Island. Of course, you can always go to our programs at foxprovidence.com and catch up on that, which you have missed. We also tweet out the programs, or at least highlights of them, on uh, Dan York's um, Twitter, uh, YORKE, Facebook, all that social media stuff. I say that to you because I want to remind you that coming up on Monday, we will have Mark Crisofulli. He is the president of Twin River for his point of view on that. But my point as well is that we haven't had a chance really to talk about that, which was a terrible weekend. Uh, and we're not going to dig into it too much this evening. We are tomorrow night going to have Linda Finn, the executive director of the Rhode Island Coalition Against Gun Violence. And I do want to send the, the word out there. Believe it or not, I know you get a lot of feedback that says, oh, how come you never have the Second Amendment pro side, da da da. First of all, I'm not anti-Second Amendment. I don't know a lot of people that are, uh, but it's, it's like pulling teeth. It's like pulling teeth to get people here to talk about, or on the radio, to talk formally um, from that perspective. So know that that's always an open invitation. In the meantime, the president's uh, headline here, you know, went to, uh, both El Paso and Dayton. Uh, it's always controversial. Uh, here was the coverage. President Trump returned to Washington Wednesday night defending his reception, tweeting, the love and respect and enthusiasm were there for all to see. He made back-to-back -back visits to the two cities rocked by mass shootings. We met with also the doctors, the nurses, uh, the medical staff. Uh, they have done an incredible job. But not everyone viewed the trips as healing. Basically play the part of him being a sympathizer when in reality it's been in his rallies that he has painted us as an unsafe city. He put a target on us and now all these people are dead. El Paso, where the alleged shooter targeted Hispanics, was especially divided. Both sides are using some strong rhetoric. Congresswoman Veronica Escobar said the president's words have hurt her community. I felt it was important that we come together and not focus on the visitor, but focus on El Paso. At his stop in Dayton, where nine people were killed Sunday, the White House did not allow reporters or cameras into the hospital, despite originally planning to do so. We left Ohio and uh, the love, the respect for the office of the presidency, uh, it was, I wish you could have been in there to see it. Oh, he was comforting was and he nice. did the right things. Ohio Senator Sherrod Brown and Dayton Mayor Nan Whaley said the president's visit was appreciated, but his normal rhetoric is not. A lot of the time his talk can be very divisive and that's the last thing we need in Dayton. Despite that, some in Dayton saw Mr. Trump's trip as his presidential duty. He's supporting the people and the families that Amen. had a, uh, a loss. Isn't it? Wouldn't that be humane for him to come? Yeah, I, you know, the president is kind of damned if he does, damned if he doesn't in, in these situations, but he's put himself in that precarious situation, in my judgment, with the rhetoric that he spews. And then he plays uh, the presidential role, or tries to at least, play the role of healer. He said something very strange this week. He said, it's a great opportunity to talk about law enforcement and the great work that they do. Uh, 
I'm sorry, mass shootings do, do not provide great opportunities to do anything. Clumsy points, oh, well, he talks clumsily. You know, he, I, I, the sensibility that he brings to the table is what I'm starving for, or a better sensibility, uh, no doubt. And, you know, the Dayton uh, the shooting is, 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 is touching for me. I'm a graduate of the University of Dayton. The Oregon District is just down the road uh, from, from my, uh, my school campus. Uh, reportedly, according to some Dayton media, the uh, the shooter was actually uh, eyeballing one of our favorite haunts as college kids, uh, just up the road on the campus, uh, or just off the campus. It's hard. I have a friend of mine, a college roommate, who came on the radio this week and explained uh, that his nephew was friendly with the shooter, and just he was blown away over the idea that he, that that connection. And the, the reason I say all this is that this stuff is 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 unfortunately in our midst. And, and we've got to just do better listening. We have to listen to each other more on both sides of the aisle to understand if there are just two sides of the aisle. I don't think there's just two. But we, have to, we just have to be a little bit more compassionate, considerate, and practical about some of the things that can still be done without infringing on significant rights bestowed by the Constitution. Uh, in the meantime, big story percolating here locally. Uh, headline here, the Ed Commissioner has put out her edict, if you will, and I, at first glance, see that it is as powerful uh, a demand as she could under the foundational law that she is using and the Board of Education, uh, and the commission, so to speak, is using. I think there's going to be a tie-up. My prediction is, well, over the next 30 days, the four entities that receive her directive, the mayor, the council, the school committee, and the acting superintendent, somebody's going to say, this is too much, because my cursory reading, and I'll check more as we go, but I just got this before showtime, my cursory reading is that she is saying, for all intents and purposes, get out of the way. We're coming in. Now, the law that allows the state to come and do this has a 30-day show cause period, meaning these folks who are directed to get out of the way can say, uh, we don't want to, and then there's this deliberation. I thought that the General Assembly needed to convene, that the governor needed to convene them, so that we had a new law that eliminated that option when the state sees crisis. Now, you know, local governance is something I've always been some, you know, significantly supportive of, but when you've proven that you can't get it done, you shouldn't be crying about still wanting to. And while the mayor has feigned the idea that he will accept what the commissioner says, I'm willing to bet you that the next 30 days aren't going to go that smoothly. We shall see, no doubt. All right, so having said that, let's, uh, let's drop the puck here, so to speak. Um, check this headline out. This is kind of cool. Or at least the full screen on the folks who are going to be inducted into the 2019 version of the Rhode Island Hockey Hall of Fame. I'm looking here at Vin's uh, production from last year. Uh, pretty fancy, fancy stuff on a first year effort last year. Yeah, we tried to do it right. You, you did. Yeah, did. Yeah. Welcome and congratulations, not only on, on what you're doing now, but just the organic idea that you had. Yeah. You're in year two now, and it almost feels like it's been around a while. Yeah, if, yeah. Do you feel that way a little yeah, bit? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's been a lot of work. Tell and, us about uh, how it started and how successful last year was. <clears throat> well, um, it really started three years ago, and we, it took two years to put the first event together. We wanted it to make a big splash with it, and I think we did. Um, we met uh, one uh, evening with uh, folks from the USA Hockey uh, affiliate here in Rhode Island, Rhode Island Hockey, and I say we, the Rhode Island Reds Heritage Society. Uh, and uh, decided that it was about time that we paid homage to a history that was as rich um, as any in the country, if not richer than most. And um, we've been playing hockey here now for 121 years. Uh, we embarked on a, on a, um, a, a process of uh, researching everyone who has ever played professional hockey out of Rhode Island, who has played in the Olympics, who has been an All-American, who has played in World Championships. We've had over two dozen uh, National Hockey League players. We've had over two dozen Olympians. We've had over 40 uh, young men and women who have played or represented the nation in, um, 
uh, in world championships, um, and we've had a couple of dozen All-Americans in college as well. Um, we have um, we've been first in so many things. Uh, one of the inductees this year is Malcolm Green Chase, uh, who um, is um, highly regarded and mostly regarded as the father of hockey in the United States. Actually, born and raised in Central Falls. Um, and uh, the, we headline our class this year with the three fathers of, of hockey. Good. So why don't we do this? Why don't we, why don't we get into the inductees and a little bit more? Back, uh, by the way, this is happening. You can buy tickets. I'm going to see this right up front. I think I just poked, I think I just poked myself. In. You do I have a mark. <laughs> the, the makeup isn't going to cover that. <laughs> okay, go uh, mask that, that was a nice move, Dan. <laughs> We're casual here. Sorry. Uh, Friday, September 6th at the Twin River uh, Center in Lincoln. Um, tickets are available, and we'll tell you how when we come back. Stay with us. This is pretty cool stuff. Check this out. For its size, Rhode Island has one of our nation's longest and richest hockey histories. The father of ice hockey in the United States, Malcolm Green Chase, was born and raised here. Brown University defeated Harvard in the first intercollegiate hockey game in 1898. The Rhode Island Reds 1955-56 season was voted the greatest in minor league history. And in 1964, the Pembroke Pandas established our country's first women's collegiate hockey program. This is Dale Arnold. These are just a few of the many historic milestones that mark an illustrious hockey history that has seen more players, coaches, and executives rise to the highest levels of this great game than to any other major sport. From Hope Street capturing Rhode Island's first schoolboy crown in 1903, to Mount St. Charles winning 26 straight state titles, and Providence College winning the 2015 NCAA championship, Rhode Island's hockey heroes have gone on to claim Olympic glory and world championships gold, earn All-America honors, have their names engraved on the Stanley Cup, and their portraits enshrined with the game's all-time greats. It's great stuff. Uh, I'm sure there'll be high-level production value at the second class for the Rhode Island Hockey Hall of Fame on September 6th at Twin River. By the way, you can uh, get tickets at rihhof.com. Just Google Rhode Island, Rhode Island Hockey Hall of Fame. We'll also link that on foxprovince.com and make sure that you're all connected and you can grab some, uh, grab some tickets. Big crowd last year. Yeah, we had over 400 people there. It was the biggest gathering of uh, hockey royalty, Rhode Island hockey royalty ever. Uh, the Bull Isles, the uh, Capuanos, the Cavanaugh's, the uh, the Bennett family, they came in from Hawaii, from California, from Florida, and on and on. Um, and we expect a similar uh, gathering this year. Yeah. You're, you're, you're making the point, I think, that it's fertile ground here and that you're not, I don't want to use the slang term, you know what it might be, but you're not exhausting your Hall of Fame caliber capital in a year or two. No, no, right? no, no, not at all. We've got over 200 uh, uh, candidates uh, for uh, for the Hall of Fame that are already documented. Wow, and how do you deliberate? How do you make these decisions? Well, the board of directors uh, gets together um, and, uh, and looks at the entire pool, and then we narrow it down to uh, this past year, 40 nominations. And we wipe our hands. We do the Punches Pilot thing, you know. We have uh, nine um, selectors, a, a committee of nine selectors, uh, people who are um, sports historians, who are hockey um, uh, purists, uh, people who have been in the uh, NHL and front offices and so forth, and really know the game, uh, both nationally, globally, and, and certainly locally. Uh, and they deliberate for two weeks with all of the information that we've gathered, all of the database, the journey that they took, uh, and then uh, they That's vote. That's a very serious effort. Absolutely, yeah, absolutely, yeah, yeah. Ed Acorn from the, uh, the Journal, who is uh, one of the great um, baseball historian and write, uh, historians and authors, uh, when he first saw the package that we gave him, he looked at it and was amazed because he's been involved in other um, such situations and, and didn't have that kind of material available to him to make an evaluation. So we felt we, uh, we did it pretty well and we, find, we followed that same pattern this year. Yeah. Uh, headlining, this, I mean, there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Um, we don't have time to, to, to tell the story of, of, of all, but 
you've got some old timers and you got some not so old timers. Yeah, here. they they, rain, they 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 fill the whole range of, of our hockey history. The three fathers of the of uh, the game of hockey here in Rhode Island. Um, everybody knows Brother Adelard, and uh, and although he started at Mount St. Charles in 1926, we were playing hockey more than 25 years earlier. Uh, maybe not on the more sophisticated, mature level that Brother Adelard led us to. Um, then we have... Of course, um, Mount has the Adelard Arena. Mount right? Adelard right. Arena, that's yeah, correct. So, yeah. Yeah. And uh, um, Judge James Dooley. Dooley was the founder of the Reds. He was the founder of the um, uh, Canadian American Hockey League, um, a Johnston guy. And, um, uh, and uh, he was a... Uh, the Amer Canadian American Hockey League is now the American Hockey League. Um, he... Um, he was also one of the great sports entrepreneurs of his period. He owned at one point in time the Providence Grays. He owned the Providence Steamroller when it won the 1928 NFL Championship in Providence. Um, he also was the man responsible for the building of uh, Gans uh, Narragansett Raceway, responsible for getting the legislature um, to uh, pass a bill that allowed it. So he was an integral part of uh, of sports in uh, in uh, in Rhode Island and in a great part in the United States in the first part of the uh, 19, 1900s. Uh, one woman, Margaret Digit Murphy. Yeah, Margaret Digitio. She's from Cranston. Um, she um, was she's certainly one of the great pioneers in women's hockey. She coached Brown University for a number of years and brought them to an elite level. I think she had uh, uh, four national championship finals that she was in. She is one of the great advocates for women's sports rights and so forth. As a matter of fact, she's in New York City today uh, talking on that. Um, she was um, um, appointed head of the Chinese um, Olympic um, uh, Development Program for women's hockey in 2022. Uh, uh, is now a um, uh, and now a, an advisor to that organization. Wow. Um, she is a two-time coach of the year in the Canadian women's. Hockey League, she won two championships there with the Boston Blades, uh, an unequaled record as far as women's hockey is concerned, and uh, absolutely wonderful um, advocate. Uh, uh, FYI, I don't know if you've noticed, this all rolls off Vin's tongue with no notes. <laughs> uh, there is one, one inductee here who uh, I happen to know, and I could tell you a story that reflects a little bit on what I think is a pretty chronic character. Um, uh, or characteristic of hockey players. I'll tell you when we come back. Stay with us. So some of the uh, the sights and sounds of not only hockey but the Rhode Island Hockey Hall of Fame. Again, uh, the 2019 inductees go in September 6th, 6th, 6th on uh, at Twin River, uh, Rhode Island Hockey Hall of Fame. Google it, buy tickets. We'll link you at foxprovidence.com. Uh, one of the inductees is Brian Boucher, who I've had the, the pleasure of knowing for a handful of years. Uh, I'm an acquaintance, no more. I've been, I'm not dropping names. But Benny, w you would agree with me that uh, that hockey players, the, the term leave it on the ice is probably all about, in general, mm. their disposition in real life. They tend to be yeah. mild-mannered, Somewhat yeah. humble. Yeah, yeah. They're they're quite a community, and uh, you know they could get into a little shoving match and maybe a fight, and then they're shaking hands and hugging each other after the uh, after the game. Well, I got to tell you a Brian Boucher story. This is one of my favorites. So uh, a handful of years ago, uh, at the at the local club that I belong to, uh, I'm in the gym by myself, thinking, oh no, 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 not. There's a guy out there. He's sliding. He's got slippers on, and he's sliding. <laughs> he's sliding on one of those boards back and forth and back and forth and the first thing that comes to my mind is this guy must ski he must be a skier so it's just two of us in the gym and I'm 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 just uh, you know doing my thing but I like to be a little social in the gym I said hey I, you're a skier he says no I play a little hockey I'm like oh no yeah, lifting and blah blah I'm going on a conversation so, so three four minutes I said um, to play uh, around here? He says, uh, no, no, I said, you, you play around here in like a 35 league or something like that, 35 and all league? <laughs> I said, no, I, I, no I, I play a little, I play a little professional hockey. Mm -hmm. I said, oh, professional? Yeah, lift it, jeez, you play for the 
P brood. He says, no, 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 I, no, I, I play for uh, this other team. Said, what team is that? He said, the Philadelphia Flyers. <laughs> <laughs> and I had known that he, that I had never met him. I, see. I said, are you Brian? He said, yeah. I said, yeah. oh my God, I am so embarrassed. <laughs> It, it, but it, it reflects on, yeah, he, yeah. you know, he, he's a, as, that's, that's, that's Boucher, they right? Humble people, yeah. But, yeah. but hockey guys are not that flamboyant. No. You know, they carry themselves yeah. in, a, in a way that are, they're relatable. Yeah, for every, every Derek Sanderson and your, your, your viewers would uh, probably know him. Uh, yeah, he was there. Are, there are 50 guys who are just quiet, regular guys, family right. men and so forth, yeah. But uh, never, ever, I had to literally pull it out of them. And yeah. we laughed. And we still laugh at the story. But um, uh, how about Brian? I mean, Brian's gone on to really the number two guy on the NBC network and probably... Uh, I mean, he's grabbed yeah, that color is, commentary uh, between the board's yeah, uh, skill set yeah, and has just yeah. run with it. He's yeah. he's doing a phenomenal job, don't yeah, you think? Yeah, he's uh, NBC is uh, honoring him with an ad this uh, this year as well in the program, and uh, he's the behind the glass guy. That's how they refer to him. Right. And, uh, he just does a wonderful job. He's got a nice demeanor with the uh, with the players. He's one of them because he's not too far off in age, you know. Sure. Pierre, the number one guy. Um, on the uh, on the network uh, is a bit older and uh, um, he was a player but uh, was in a different capacity so to speak uh, so uh, no, he's uh, he's a, a favorite of, uh, of NBC you can tell you know yeah. so tell me people come to the Rhode Island Hockey Hall of Fame obviously it speaks for itself uh, but there's gonna be a lot going on on, on Friday September 6th you got a minute lay it out to a cell well, we have a cocktail reception at 6 o'clock. Uh, all of the inductees will be there. Um, uh, Brian Burke, Brian Boucher, um, David Emma, our Hobie Baker Award winner here in Rhode Island. Uh, Digit will be there. Um, um, the families of, uh, of all of these players uh, will be there as well. Uh, the Capuanos will have, I think, two or three tables of, of folks there. Uh, uh, the Emmas will have about two or three tables of, uh, of people there. The Eccleston family will be there. Tom, but, one of the but you want you want the general public to, to, to come in there. Twin River is a yeah. big place, yeah. and the more the tickets yeah. are sold, the bigger the room becomes. Right, right, right. right. And the uh, it's a great opportunity for them to uh, to rub shoulders and shake hands with people that their children, for example, uh, may not have heard about, and this is their opportunity to know where they came from. That's why we did this to to grow the game, uh, to pay tribute to these folks. Um, um, and to, um, to give them their, their due. We're going to be installing a, an interactive touchscreen kiosk at the Dunk this year. Oh, a very cool. modern uh, piece of equipment. Uh, for the hall. Of, right. Instead of hitting uh, the, the touchstone for a cheeseburger, you'll get Zelio Tapazzini or you'll get Brian Boucher and all this history. And all the information. Yeah. Yeah. Congratulations. Yeah, thank you. It's great thank work. You. Thank you. Uh, September 6th, buy the tickets. Final word when we come back. You know, the uh, gun violence conversation in this country is, you know, back at this level, understandably. The Rhode Island Coalition Against Gun Violence Executive Director, Linda Finn, will be here tomorrow on her perspective. Um, we've already recorded the program, so I know it's a, it's a calm, cool, collected conversation. And I do suggest that if you've got a different point of view, you're going to be welcome here to talk about it. All right? So... FYI on that. We'll see you tomorrow night and on the radio at 3 on WPRO. Thanks for tuning in. Good night.